Today, we've got Nicholas Nick on the show with Lead Mining Pros. And Nicholas Nick started his own multiple seven-figure company. I was a restaurant manager for 13 years. I did the worst jobs for the least amount of money. My boss is an asshole. His boss is an even bigger asshole. If you don't want to be your boss, you got to get out. And so I left. I got really lucky. I applied to a Craigslist ad uh, for a clever investor. I would cold call every day in his community for him. I went live in the Facebook group and I cold called for an hour. Wow. In front of everyone for four months. And then eventually they started calling me up and going, can I pay you to call for me? Now we're in our biggest year ever. I'm gonna net a million dollars. I'm a very profitable company. Welcome back to another episode of the Austin Zayback Show. Today, we've got Nicholas Nick on the show with Lead Mining Pros. And I've known Nicholas Nick actually for a really long time. We'll dive in maybe a little bit into that story. But um, I met him through a guy by the name of Cody Sperber. Yeah. Um, you know, for a lot of you watching, you probably know that name, right? The Clever Investor. And um, and Nicholas Nick, you know, branched out uh, quite a while ago and started his own company, yeah. you know, multiple seven-figure company. Um, really providing value to real estate investors at a really high level. So if you're watching right now and you're a real estate investor, you're a wholesaler, you're a flipper, uh, you do anything in that world, you know, make sure you stay to the end of the video because Nicholas Nick has done something that, you know, very few people have done. So appreciate you being here, yeah. bro. And I'm excited to dive into Absolutely, it. Absolutely, dude. No, my pleasure, man. Yeah. Pleasure. So for people who don't know you, man, you know, um, talk to me a little bit about like, what was your what did your world look like before starting lead mining pros like what how did it how did you go from like whatever you were doing to what you're doing today yeah you know um i like this actually on the way over here uh your assistant called and asked me a couple of questions and the uber driver when i hung up he was like damn bro and so your question you just asked like what's my journey it's cool because i've kind of just been living out with this uber driver because he's like how did you get there i'm answering her questions <laughs> but having a million dollar company he picks my brain right afterward um but you know my, my journey's been interesting and one of my favorite quotes is that steve Jobs said was you can only connect the dots looking backwards right and i think that sometimes we're going through shit and, you know, they say you can't see the forest through the trees. And it's like, we don't realize that we're, we're making our story right now. You know, so mine was unique. I was a restaurant manager for 13 years, wow. ages 18 to 31. Um, worked way too hard. I remember my first day at IHOP. I managed IHOPs for four years. My very first day, Nick, someone shit on the floor. I was like, wow, talk about an, yeah. an inaugural welcome right there. And I should have known, like, and I, and I love that story because it really sets the tone. That's exactly what a restaurant mm. industry, you don't know what the hell's going to happen. And I share that story because it's that kind of fearlessness that kind of got me to where I'm at today. You know, I did the worst jobs for the least amount of money. Mm. Uh, restaurant industry, after 13 years, I capped at 65000 a year, which may be a lot for 15 years ago now, and I'm kind of learning that. <laughs> yep, for sure. Um, but it may have been a lot for that long ago. Uh, but 70 hours a week to make $65,000, you know, I really felt like I, I had a ceiling. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew I was exceptional. I was a student, audiobooks every day on the way to and from work. When I got to work, I would use the audiobooks on the employees and yeah. see like what worked for me. Like I was really good like that. Um, so my time came to an end at restaurants. Uh, I knew I, the word I used which might resonate with some people is I ran out of role models. Mm -hmm right? My boss is an asshole. His boss is an even bigger asshole. And I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want to be these people. What am I doing here? And that's the other thing. If you don't want to be your boss, mm. you got to get out. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm sure like a lot of your staff looks up to you and where you are and the way you handle situations. You know, if you handle situations poorly, they, it doesn't matter how rich you are. Mm. They don't want anything to do with that. Right. And so I ran out of role models and I, I knew I didn't want to be anyone that I was around. And so I left. Uh, then I got really lucky. I applied to a Craigslist ad, uh, for a clever investor and they hired me and I was an event coordinator, which was cool. So like restaurants, I was like, my pitch to them was, well, restaurants are basically an event I throw <laughs> <laughs> for 12 hours a day. I can definitely throw your events. Never did it before. Mm. Um, they brought me on. I threw an event right away with them. I threw another event and then I started throwing all of the clever labs and that's mm -hmm. where we met initially yep. um, was all of those. I'm throwing Cody's events. Then I started throwing events for Dean Graziosi. Mm -hmm. I wasn't out of the restaurant industry for 10 months and I'm working with Dean Graziosi. 
it really makes me want to cry just saying that because I knew I was in that industry for too long. I knew I should have gotten out. And now I'm working with like Tony Robbins, right hand man. And I, like within 10 months. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when I knew I'm on the right path. Right. Yep. Um, then, you know, I, I take it. A lot of people say, you know, how did you found this lead generation business? Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, are you, are you an investor or something? No, no, better. I was an executive at a real estate education company. Mm -hmm. So I was a part of a thousand investors journey. If I was just one investor, I'd only have my experience. But because we had a thousand students or clients, I was able to learn from all of that. And one of the biggest things I've learned is new, well, a lot of people, but mainly new people get lost in the sauce when it comes to setting up lead generation systems, mm -hmm. software, scripts, and, you know, and their students at the time, um, they, that, that's a whole nother business. Lead generation is another business, it, uh, separate from real estate investing. Yep. Like it is not the same thing. You have to have your whole own leg. And what I started doing at clever was I started teaching. I didn't know this back then, but the clients to create their own, uh, to do their own leads, mm. cold call, everybody call everyone up, do all this stuff. So, um, then fast forward to my time, um, running out at clever. Mm -hmm. Cody was actually a huge part of my journey. I made a deal with Cody uh, that I would work from home and I would cold call every day in his community for him. Mm -hmm. Like I was like, I want to be a real estate investor and I will show them it's possible live mm -hmm. every day. So every day I went live in the Facebook group and I cold called for an hour wow. in front of everyone for four months. And that is actually why lead mining is here today. And I didn't realize, and Cody didn't either, nobody did, that that was going to be the start mm -hmm. of this. But that was that's branding. Yeah. <laughs> I accidentally, I had 700 people watching me every day going, oh, wow, you're doing such a good job. Or, oh, wow, he's just doing it. And then eventually they started calling me up and going, can I pay you to call for me? Mm -hmm. That's how it started. It was my birthday. Wow. Was, and, and a customer called me, Mario Fernando. Uh, thank you, Mario. First customer ever. And he said, man, I see you cold calling. I'm busy. I'm a police officer down here in Miami. Can I pay you to call for me? I was like, yeah, you can pay me. Do anything you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I'll do anything for money. How'd you know? Um, and then, yeah, so that was actually, you know, the start. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. It's crazy. Why do you think you stayed in the restaurant industry for so long? Like, because I think a lot of people watching, there might be people watching, right? I think probably a lot that they're in a job that they, they just, they, th they feel how you felt. Right. Like, this isn't the end all be all, yeah. right? Like, and it's some crappy job, it's some crappy place. Right. It's just like, you know, it's draining. Just, yeah, it's just like yeah. they're not passionate about it. Like, that, you know, um, you know, and I think a lot of people are in that same situation where they stay for way too long. Yeah. Cause it's comfortable, fill in the blank, right? So, yeah. why do you think you stayed for so long? You know, other than I'm a glutton for punishment. Right. Whether that's toxic relationships or toxic work relationships. Right. Like w one of the things I told the Uber driver on the way over here is. Before you get to our level, mm -hmm. you're used to something in your life sucking mm. and we're actually OK with it. We give it a green light. It's OK if something sucks. Yeah. My boss sucks. Well, bosses are supposed to suck. Mm. Well, my job sucks. Well, it's supposed to suck. And. Uh, you could call that eating shit. I kind of call that eating shit. And I think one thing I taught myself is I got really good at eating shit mm. when I was a restaurant employee. And I then I told myself, I love eating shit. Mm. And you really kind of have to. And people are probably at home probably are like, yeah. And what eating shit is, it's you're doing something you don't want to do, but you've, you've talked yourself into having a good attitude about it. Now, there's a lot of skill in that, right? There, you gain, you. that's really where the learning comes mm. from. But your goal is to eat so much shit, you never have to eat it again, mm. right? And that's when I say that's back to where we're at now, right? It's different. Like, I, did I hire the wrong person? That's our biggest problem now. I must mm. have hired the wrong person now. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's not all on me anymore, you know? And so um, going through that and getting used to that punishment was tough. I actually left because um, I, was, I was actually in physical pain. Mm. Um, I didn't realize I was getting stomach ulcers because of stress. Mm. And I'll never forget this customer comes in and we were like really close and, and I'm telling her about it. And she goes, Nick, I, I think, I, I don't think your body can handle the stress. I was like, but my mind feels fine. She goes, no, Nick, your mind is powerful. Your mind can handle the stress. Your body cannot. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a lot of wisdom because I didn't feel 
stressed, mm -hmm. right? Or maybe I talked myself out of it feeling stressed, but my, my body. And so the day I quit restaurants, um, and just to share with you guys, cause what happens, it's a breaking point. So mm -hmm. why, and then why did I leave? Yeah. It would be a great follow-up question. I'll ask myself now, but, uh, but you know, why did I leave? And I'll tell you, so I always worked out of the city I lived in. I always commuted an hour each way. They finally opened up a restaurant in my city. Finally, no more commute. Where at? Lakeland, okay. Florida. Okay. Um, finally, I show up to work. I'm scheduled 15 hours a day, six days a week. That's mm. 90 hours a week. And no one else was on the schedule. And I'm not that guy. I work with the team works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, and I pull the GM and I go, what's this? And he goes, oh, well, we've been working 90 hours a week for the last six weeks waiting for you to show up. Mm. So now that you're here, you're giving us all the time off and you need to pay your dues. Mm -hmm. And I'd been with this company four and a half years. <laughs> I've been working like crazy the whole time. And I was like, yeah, not paying my dues. I've already paid them. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're not starting that over. Finally in my hometown. So it was like this really visual representation of disrespect. Mm. Finally in my hometown, the store finally opened that they hired me for four years prior. Get to go there. Doesn't matter if the commute's not there. I'm working more hours. I'm being treated unjustly. I mm -hmm. previously had the stomach pain. Mm -hmm. And I told my boss, I said, fix the schedule or I'm out. Mm. We're all working the same. If every, if all, uh, if every other manager is working 90, I'm in for 90. Yeah. I'm not going to be the only one working 90 and everyone else working 75. Um, the next day I came in, the schedule wasn't fixed and I walked. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing I say. When you have a job for that long, you have to walk. Yeah. They called me. They offered me more money. They offered me less hours. And that's why you have to walk because they'll sweeten the golden handcuffs. Mm -hmm. If you really are good, they won't let you go. And they tried to not let me go. And you have to walk because if you don't, they'll just sweeten the pot and then you'll be right back in on giving up on your dreams or giving up what's right for you out there. Yeah. Yeah. It's so powerful, dude. There's yeah. so many people that are probably in that same situation, you know, and I, and I've been there, right. I've been in the, in the role of having a job, you know, I've had a lot of jobs in my life and I remember the last job that I ever worked and I, it was a very similar story. So yeah. I, I can relate big yeah. time. Right. Um, so then talk to me about the evolution. You know, you go, you work for Cody, you work for Dean, you're doing all this crazy stuff in a very short period of time. Right. You're learning a ton. I mean, you're learning yeah. about real estate investing right. and like all kinds Doing of stuff events. that you really never knew anything about. Right. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Right. You, prior to that, you didn't know anything about real estate. So I remember when I, my first couple of days working at Clever, I was like, what are we months? Yeah. What, what the fuck do we do here? You're like, what's wholesaling? Yeah. And, well, and then it's mentorship. Right. I don't know what mentorship was either. Yeah. And so I was like, I don't know. Like I, I joke and say, I was flipping burgers for 30 years. Mm. I didn't know what flipping a house meant. Mm. Right. And on top of that, like the, the first call I ever took, this is how I knew I was in the right place. My, my first, the phone rings, I'm working at Clever, phone rings. Hello. Thank you for choosing Clever Investor. This is Nicholas. Hey, Nick, man. I don't even know the guy. I just want to tell you that uh, I just closed on my first deal. I made $70,000 on my first deal. I, I was so shocked. You know what I said to him? I said, did you know I worked 70 hours a week for 52 weeks last year to make $70,000? Yeah. And that's when I knew I'm in the right fucking place. Mm. Wow. That's cool. So powerful, dude. Yeah, it was so yeah. cool. So cool. So talk to me about that journey then, right? Of learning all that. And then at what point, you know, do you branch off then and start lead mining pros? You talked about that first client, right? Right. And how that kind of evolved because you're making cold calls live. Yeah. Which is super cool, by the way. Who are you calling? You just calling motivated sellers? Yeah, I was, I was looking for my own deal. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I was just, I was pulling list of absentee owners. I was actually doing my whole business now. I was pulling the list. I was skip tracing it. I was showing the students how to do it. I wasn't the business. So yeah. I was showing them all how to do it for themselves. And that's also the perk of done for you. Mm -hmm. I can, that's actually a good idea. I actually should just show everyone how to do exactly what we yeah. do. Because the goal isn't how to do it. It's that we do it at a professional level yeah. without needing training or anything else. But, um, but yeah, you know, I was just, I was just called my first list ever was a list from New York that was called a shock and awe campaign, mm. which you might know what that is. It's whether you just threaten that you're going to take the house from them or mm -hmm. something. It's like some urgent call me now about your property. Like yeah. the house is on fire thing. 
And that was the best because it was the worst, mm. right? Shock and awe leads. They're all grumpy as fuck. We sent them some weird threatening letter mm-hmm. or that triggered them to call. They don't even have a need to sell. They're just confused, right? Yeah. And so I think, you know, entering in that realm, and that's actually how I knew to create lead mining, which is, I think, is somewhat of your question. When I was making these calls in my first two months, I sucked. Mm. I absolutely sucked. And I had so many leads. And right away, being in restaurants for so many years, I knew if I could suck this bad and do this good, I can scale it. Yep. Right? Exactly what you were talking about. Like with, so like we can tell when it's scalable. Yep. Right? And if I have no skill and I can do this at this high of a level, I can scale this. And that's when I knew to lean in Mm. to cold calling. Yep. Because I had no skill. I'd never cold called a day in my life before those videos in that community. Yeah, so cool, man. So then talk to me about like day one, dude, of you saying, all right, I'm all in. I'm starting my own company now. I'm being, I'm an entrepreneur, you yeah. know, like I'm I'm going all in on this. I'm walking away from Clever. I'm walking yeah. away from Dean. I'm walking away from yeah. all these big people that I'm helping right now. And I'm going to go all in on my own thing. Yeah. You know, like when was that moment? Man, I, uh, I'll never forget this day. So... I log online. I'm very competitive. Right? I think actually what I've learned about my is I need to compete in order to even win anyway. So I'll create fake competitions with me and my family members or me and friends just so I can yeah. accomplish my own goals. I don't want to beat them. I want to beat the laziness out of myself. But so I log into Facebook one day and there's a Filipino averaging their advertising their foreign call center mm. in broken English. And at the time, I think I only had three people paying me, you know, so like I really had nothing. You know, uh, I had, I was working from home for Cody and I had three people paying me to make cold calls for them. And I wake up one day and I see higher call center, $3 hour. And I was like, this person can't even type a message and she has the balls to advertise her business. And I've never advertised mine. Mm-hmm. You know, one thing they say about a great business is if you have a great business, you're obligated to share it with the world. Yeah. I need to put it in everyone's hands. They're hiring the wrong company right now. The right company is waiting for them. Mm-hmm. So I make this post and I joke and I always say it was written by the heavens. And it, and it literally started with, hey, guys, I've never done this before, but I'm starting something different. And the thing that made us different, and to this day, it's the same. We're all American. Mm-hmm. So we actually just removed foreign callers off the website yesterday. We're all American cold callers. Wow. And that Which was, we're going to dive into in a little while. Yeah. yeah. But that, that was unique then. And to this day, I'm still the only company. A lot of mm-hmm. people might say they have expatriates or American-born mm-hmm. callers. Yeah. All mine live in the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, and I made this post. Hey, I have these Americans. Right? We're getting great results, blah, blah, blah. That post had 285 comments on it. Wow. And I remember, um, and back then, Facebook was very plain. This was 12, seven years ago. If it's, uh, people they weren't even, they even say they just start all commenting their email addresses. Mm-hmm. That's all everyone <laughs> they didn't even say, I didn't say comment yeah. your email below, but they all just saw I'm like, okay, well, I guess I gotta do something with everybody's email. Mm-hmm. So I write up these 13 bullet points. I bet I even have it stored to this day, 13 bullet points, and I sent it out to every person. And I sit up till two in the morning that mm-hmm. night. And then the, the comments kept going. It was going viral, this post. It was inside of a Facebook group. Yep. That's why it was going so big. And it was just blowing up. And then the next day I wake up, and that's why I'm telling the story this way too. The next day I wake up and the post was deleted. Mm. Okay. Because it was in a group. Yeah, by the moderator. That's right. Yeah. I don't I don't own the group. Yep. It wasn't my Facebook page. Mm-hmm. Other people can delete it. So I wake up and it's deleted. And I'm like, hey, this is weird. So I call the owner of the group and he goes, Yeah, well, I'll be honest with you. He goes, he goes, Well, why'd you delete it? He goes, mm-hmm. Well, you're lucky I didn't delete it yesterday, but I was on a boat with my family <laughs> all day. And I was like, oh, shit. And I said, well, it's good. I already emailed all 290 yeah. people. But if you think of that story, if I would have said, it was Sunday on that day. That's why he was on the boat. Mm-hmm. I could have said, I'll get to this post tomorrow. Yeah, you would have lost every email. I w- I, I, dude, I would still be working at Clever Investor today. Wow. <laughs> you know, yep. if, if, if I didn't seize the day, and that's why I wanted to tell the story like that. Mm-hmm. The next day is now Monday. The email prompted 20 sales calls. I closed 10 of them and I literally put in my notice that same exact day. Wow. 
with Cody. Yep. And to be honest with you, I probably quit too soon, right? I didn't, I, didn't, I mean, I didn't, yeah. but you know. Like, yep, in like, retrospect, uh, yeah. I, I, I should have had a little bit more yeah. stable footing, but I'm a burn the boats kind of mm-hmm. guy, you know, and I could tell that this was working. And then that, that was when this blew up. And just yeah. so you know, from that day on, our first six months, we did $360,000 in sales. Our first three months, I didn't even have a website. Mm-hmm. I did $150,000 in sales just using web forms wow. for people that were interested. And my company, from that day on, we've never done less than $7,000 in a single week from that day that post was made. Wow. And now we average $35,000 a week in sales. That's week. awesome, dude. Crazy. Yeah. That that day, right, when you're, here you are, you have three clients and you, you send out 290 emails, right? What were you offering then? What was the offering? Like you said, you you, you got 20 calls, you, you closed 10. What did you close them on? You know, that's such a good question. This is going way back. So the email I sent them was like 13 bullet points of what we do, mm-hmm. right? We'll pull the list, we'll skip trace it, we'll call it. We call everyone up to three times if they don't answer. We ask these qualifying questions. Mm-hmm. We'll send the leads over to you at the end of the day. We track your KPIs, all that stuff. So that's what the email was. What I was offering and this is only, I only 500 dials a week. Yeah. So I'm a career employee. I've been getting paid weekly my whole life. I'll be honest with you. I, when I was cold calling for real estate during those three months, I had three properties under contract. All three people woke up one day and told me to go fuck myself. Mm -hmm. And I told myself, fuck real estate. I cannot live off of the unstable Mm -hmm. means. Again, I'm a career employee. If I was a big commission sales guy, I'd probably be more comfortable with losing big deals. Yeah. My whole life I'd been salaried with restaurants or mm-hmm. salaried with this. So I'm thinking at home and I'm like, okay, so I can't, I don't want, I don't want people to take my money away from me. I don't want yeah. someone to wake up and change their mind. And I just lost $35,000. Mm-hmm. Right. So I was like, I need to get paid weekly. So I was like, I'll do 500 dials a week. Mm. So our only product for like those six months, other than list pulling and skip tracing, the only cold calling product was 500 dials per week. Wow. That was it. American di- American dialers, because you weren't doing it all for all 10, were you at that point? Like you weren't the one cold calling so anymore. So I was, yeah, so I cold called until I cried in front of the computer because yeah. I had too much work to do. For sure. Like literally. And then you had to hire somebody. Right, what a beautiful reason to cry. But sure. yeah, but you're exactly right. And so I think I probably called on like the first five clients and then I had a breakdown mm-hmm. and I made, yeah. then I made a post and then I trained uh, like eight people in one meeting. Mm-hmm. Um, three of those people stayed with me for four years. Wow. Yeah. Dang. And they became my manager. All American? Like, all American. Okay. Always. And what type of demographic at that point? And I'm sure it's changed and we'll dive into the nitty gritty of it. But like at that point, are we talking about like a stay at home mom type of demographic? Are we talking about? The first crew was mostly men. Okay. And, um, one of, you'd be surprised the people that come out of the woodwork when you offer a 13 to $15 an hour work from home to cold call. One guy yeah. was a millionaire entrepreneur looking to free up some time and learn how to do real estate investing. Mm-hmm. Another guy was an investor who was struggling and just trying to make some actually, struggling investors are the best employees of mine. Yeah. They come in, I give them solid pay. Well, not solid, but consistent pay, mm-hmm. you know, and then, and they're learning, and they're perfecting their craft on my dime sure and they're great cold callers so i love it so anyone looking for work i got you uh, yeah. but um, seriously again i hire americans so anyone watching i mean i'm hiring always mm-hmm. and we're gonna put all the links down below too yeah, yeah. um use but, code zayback by the yeah, way yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes sir um but mostly men um they did a great job i did have a couple of women to this day i am mostly women okay and that's not i don't hunt i don't seek out mm-hmm. a demographic like, sure. I make a post. I'm hiring American cold callers, work from home, no sales, follow the script. And I offer a $50 bonus every week if you work at least 25 hours a week. Mm. Okay. Okay. So the reason why that exists is I treat my employees like Uber drivers. You create the schedule. Mm. You decide when you want to work. I don't, I'm not saying, hey, you're nine to noon, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I'm not that guy. Mm-hmm. That's a whole nother layer of management I'm not messing with. I'm more like Uber. Uber doesn't schedule their drivers. I don't schedule my callers. Right? If yep. you don't show up for several weeks, you know, you might not, I'm not I mean, I won't, uh, no one gets fired for sure. that same regard. They, people just phase themselves out. Yep. Naturals call more, unnaturals quit working, right? So it's a kind of a cool system uh, that saves itself. But now mostly women, and it's because they stick around. Women mm. are more consistent. Men, and no knock to them, but they're always looking for like the next big thing or the next mm. thing that changed their life. 
Um, and to this day, my average employee has been with me for five years. Wow. At the moment. Yeah. It's crazy. So they enjoy what they do, you yeah. know, 100%, right? For anybody who doesn't know, talk to me about, you know, uh, like somebody might be watching, right? And they're like, what's skip tracing? What's data? Like, what's just like, let's just go there real yeah, quick. Absolutely. And just talk about like, what do, you, what do you mean when you say that? Okay, gotcha. I'll yeah. do a couple of things. I'll cover everything that we offer. Cool. And then through that, I'll define some stuff yep. too. Uh, so what we offer is I can pull lists in any market in America. Okay. And what's the, when you say a list, what do you mean? A list is like a series of records based off of a demographic that you're looking for. So let's say, hey, Nick, I want homes in Paradise Valley mm -hmm. that are valued at one to three million. Um, and then I could pull every homeowner in Paradise Valley that owns a home at that value. Okay. So we can get our target down. That's our targeted prospects would be a list, right? Mm -hmm. um, then we have our list after we pull that list and we can take all criteria, equity amounts, property value range, property type, pre-foreclosure, multifamily, commercial, mobile home, land. We can do all of them. Um, and then you can give us property values, equity amounts, and then everything else. Um, then after that, we skip trace it. Mm -hmm. I always say skip trace is the art of finding an accurate phone number. Okay. okay. So I need a name and an address. And with those two things, I can get a phone number. Our phone numbers, because I have a call center, I have a proven accuracy of over 85%, mm -hmm. which is amazing. So we get the right person on the phone 85% of the time or more. Uh, then what we do is we put American callers on the phone. Mm -hmm. They call everyone up to three times if they don't answer. If they do answer, we ask them if they own the property, if they've ever considered selling. And that's important. Have you ever mm -hmm. considered selling? When you're talking to a lead, you want to cast the widest net yep. to catch a yes. Right? I call it cracking the nut open. You know, however we can crack open that nut. Let's not know. Oh, well, have you been thinking about selling in the last week? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're just narrowing it down. We're just, yeah. we're trying to get a no with questions like that. Have you ever considered selling? Um, then if they say yes, we ask 12 qualifying questions. 12. 12. Yeah. Wow. All about the property. I can rattle those off real quick. If yeah. You rattle them off. Yeah, yeah. You got it. Any general repairs needed? And how old's the roof? When was the last time it was remodeled? Are there any tenants in the property? Is there a mortgage on the property? If so, how much is left on the mortgage? What's your timeline to sell? How much do you want to sell for? Would you be open to taking that total amount in monthly payments? Mm -hmm. It's a very sneaky yep. owner finance question. Ron Legrand gave us that question. He's like, that's how I would ask that. Mm -hmm. um, is there a better phone number for you? Is there a good email address for you? When's the best time for my partner to follow back up with you? And then we say, thank you so much for your time. My partner, Austin, will give you a call back in the next 24 hours. And they're probably going to want to come out and see the house. Yeah. And we do that for, we found that to be very important that we call ourselves your partner. Mm -hmm. Right. As soon as we show up like an employee, they want to get us fired. Yep. Right. Who's your boss? Yeah. I'm going to tell them you are disrespectful. Like the whole energy shifts. No, we are owners. So another little tip, if you guys have your own call centers, mm -hmm. I'm calling on behalf of doesn't work. I'm calling for my boss doesn't work. Mm. They have to feel there has to be some level of authority. Mm. No one wants to think a peon's calling them. Authority, but at the same time, you're not the final decision maker. That's right. Yep. That's exactly. Yeah. We're in this cool gray area. Yep. yep. Our partner's got that. Yep. yep. Anything else? Talk to the partner, you know? Love it. Um, and so, and then after we call everyone, um, we text message everybody too. Oh, wow. Yeah. And our texting is really good. Even if you have a good conversation with them, it's like a follow up. I don't text. even care. No, really? Yeah. No, it's a, it's another blind. Have you ever considered selling? for? Oh, got it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Everything's done to everyone. Yeah. Uh, again, you know, as a lead generator and you might be able to like there, you hire us. No stone unturned. Yep. Nick beat the shit out of that list. And that's how I want you. I don't want you being awake at night going, God, could he have? No, Hold we did another it. lead out of there. Yeah. Right. We did it. I remember we had one client. I swear to you, we had 98 leads. And then he meets, he's disappointed. He meets with me and he goes, Nick, uh, we got 98 leads, uh, but you know, none of them are closing. And he goes, I, I think you guys are missing something. And I said, no offense, but with 98 leads, I don't think we missed a thing. Yeah. I said, I think you're missing something. Mm. I said, I said, if I was to guess, you might be prejudging the lead. You're telling yourself, you know what they're thinking. You're going, I don't have to call that guy. Look, he said this, he said that, you know, cause I can tell like, if, yeah. first of all, the, our rule of thumb is if you don't have a contract and 20 leads, you're doing something wrong for sure. Period. Yep. You know, our average client closes a deal in 12 to 20. That's why I say, look, if you're at 20, mm -hmm. you miss something. It's not a jab. I'm not jabbing at you. 
but go back, go back to the drawing board. And I, I often relate the pursuit of leads to being a detective, mm. right? Mm-hmm. Like we've seen the movies where they're hunting serial killers and the faces are on the walls yeah. and, and the strings are uh, nailed in. And that's what we need to do. What did we, what clues did you miss mm. or what clues did you over perceive and talk yourself out of the lead, mm-hmm. right? Out of even calling them in the first place. Yeah, totally. What do you, what is your thought? Like, what would you say to somebody watching right now? That's like, yeah, Nick, like, but cold calling doesn't work anymore. Like, what would you say to that guy? So I would say it definitely depends on your market. Okay. There are markets I would not at, well, first of all, there's a big difference between paying me to do it mm-hmm. and doing it yourself. If you've got the time, you do it yourself, you can invest more time in your market. We are a premium service. For example, I don't recommend cold calling in Phoenix. Yep. I don't recommend cold calling in Southern California. I don't recommend cold calling in Dallas. I don't recommend calling in Houston, Atlanta, or Miami, or Orlando. Mm-hmm. But those are the only markets I don't recommend cold calling in. Yep. Okay. And, and why? Because what we don't realize is, well, simply, simply put, the more their phone rings by anybody else, the less the chance you can have to get it. And yep. I used to live in Phoenix. Mm-hmm. And even when I lived here, everyone fucking calls you. Everybody. The windshield repair guy calls you. Yeah. AT&T's fucking calling you. Yep. If Starbucks had your phone number, they'd be calling you too, asking <laughs> you why you want why you. Like, yeah. e- like Phoenix wants your money so bad. And not they do. These metro areas you're being marketed to by life insurance, health insurance, everything. Yep. It's not just your A, you have a lot more competition in real estate, A. Yep. B, you have competition in, on the phone, mm. period. Period. Mm-hmm. So the more they're being bombarded, the more they're being trained by other companies to stop answering their phone. Got it. And then I can tell you for, as a fact, Jack, if real estate investors are pulling lists and cold calling them, so is life insurance mm-hmm. and AT&T. And they're going for the top metro. So yep. that's my f- main reasoning Makes why, sense. Why, yeah. why not to do it. For sure. Would you also say that another reason, because uh, I've thought about this before and I've, and, and it's not to be like, you know, uh, to, it's not to be like judgy or anything. Right. But like when you look at demographics, you know, and you look at the people that live in these, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollar homes, you know, these people are slightly more savvy than maybe let's just say mm-hmm. somebody in Indianapolis living in a hundred and ten thousand dollar home. It's right. just, it's just the truth most of the time. Right. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean it's always the truth. Yeah. Right. right? It can obviously not be the case, but on average, I've seen, you know, somebody living in California in a million dollar home, they're probably a little bit smarter. They're a little savvier. They know people. They kind of know the game maybe, you know, as opposed to somebody in the middle of nowhere, you know, or like in in a market like Indianapolis Mm. and North Carolina or somewhere like that, where it's just the environment's different, right? right? Like they've been living in a different environment for their whole life. Yeah. Therefore, the they're just gonna be you can you can typically have a better conversation with that person on the phone. Yeah. Right. Right. In my opinion. Yeah. No. You're talking and you're, you're you're relating to like suburban. Yeah. If you will, and uh, and that that's our sweet spot, mm-hmm. right? Suburban and rural. I always say if you're in a, if you're a wholesaler and you hear someone say they invest in a city you've never heard of, mm-hmm. your ear should perk up. Yeah. If you haven't heard of it. I mean, a lot of people haven't either. Mm -hmm. And that's where the greatest leads come from. And to your point, resources is a big deal. Resource and general knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. So when we think about the smaller towns where I was flipping burgers in, I didn't even know real estate was a thing. And that's what happens in those smaller towns. Mm -hmm. The average collective intellectual person doesn't have those resources at their fingertips. Yeah. Right. And so there's a thing about living in San Diego. Everyone knows what their house is. That's the other part. Everyone knows what their house is worth when you live in an area that's super affluent. When you're in this little crappy area, like, yeah, I've just been living here 30 years. You know, mm-hmm. I don't know. The whole family grew up here. Like they're not as yeah. savvy. And that doesn't mean that we take advantage or not take advantage, but that, that we're, we, our skills need to freshen up, mm. right? We need to be able to go toe to toe. And that's the other part I tell people is you can cold call in Phoenix and, and I bet you can and do, but is your budget appropriate? Sure. You yep. know, people say, well, I want to start in Miami. And so I looked it up. Miami is the fifth richest city in the world, mm. not America. Wow. Okay. I didn't even know that. Yeah. I didn't either. 
but it makes sense. All those damn big ass yachts I saw last time I was there. <laughs> and they're freaking For sure. Huge, dude. For sure. You know? mm-hmm. um, but I'm looking at this and um, I'm realizing it. And I said, well, that means you're competing with the fifth richest. And we have to do the math. Yep. If it's the fifth richest city in the world, then then the it's also the fifth richest real estate investment market, which sure. means my competition can afford to put fifty thousand dollars a month. There's other thing I tell people: Why does this market suck to cold call in? Well, you don't have a big enough budget. Yeah, that's right. If your competitor is dumping fifty thousand, same thing as PPC is the best way to think of it. Yep. Because Google manages the PPC cost. Sure. Based off of demand, there's no cold calling PPC cost. Yep. But if they're being pounded by, if someone's putting $50,000 into that market and then another person and four other people are putting $50,000 in the market, your $500 a month budget. It's nothing. It's nothing. Yeah. Right. And it's just the sheer numbers of it. And that's what I tell people. Why? I said, if you just started playing basketball, would you, would you want to play against Michael Jordan? Mm-hmm. No. Then why are you doing that with your real estate investing dollars? Mm. Right. And just to like remind them, it's like, Hey, Start in the junior leagues, yeah. right? In the little crappy cities outside of it. And then the, my biggest rebuttal there is, well, what if there's no buyers out there? Oh, what if there's no investors? Mm-hmm. And I say, did you know that every place that is for rent is owned by an investor? Yeah. So are you telling me in that little town, there's no places for rent? And they're like, oh, like, you know, it's like little things like that. And that's why I think the biggest thing is our self-limiting beliefs, what we tell ourselves. People say, oh, well, I heard Phoenix is the best place to get a deal. And I say, you're right. To get, if you have a deal, Phoenix is the best place to be. Mm -hmm. If you're looking for a lead, (laughs) it is not the best place to be. For sure. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I was saying, I always tell people, I say that the easier it is to get the deal, right? The, the harder it'll be to sell on the back end, typically. And then the harder it is to get the deal on the front end, the easier it'll be to sell on the back end. And that's exactly right? what I, and that's the other part. So I have a client hire me and his results suck. And I go, well, where is this? And he goes, oh, this isn't the hottest zip code in Kansas City. I'm like, oh, well, then the results are good again. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Four leads in the middle of nowhere. That's horrible. Four leads in the hottest zip code in the hottest city in Kansas. Yep. Now, now we're actually talking. And to your, and it's funny, I also do this too. I remember one time someone only had five leads and I was, I was like, ah, you know, it's not really that good. And I get done talking. He goes, did I tell you I closed a deal? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, you know, I should lead with. Yeah. How did the leads go right. before I, cause I'm only looking at the numbers. Sure. So I'm only, but it's like, you know, I love stories like that because to your point is when you do get less, you know, you can do more with it if yeah. you are in one of those hot markets. Agreed, dude. Cause yeah. someone will buy it. Like if you're in Dallas, you get a property on a contract, it's selling. For like sure. That, that's Especially not if you question. get it at the right price. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, talk to me about like, so for people who are watching that are like, dude, you know, like I could go hire people in the Philippines to cold call for me for a fraction of the cost. Like, why not just do that? Right. Like, I want to know the difference between in your opinion, because you see it, dude. Like you see, I mean, I've seen Egyptian cold callers. I've yeah. seen Filipino cold callers. I've seen uh, like, I mean, dude, everything you could possibly imagine yeah. out there. Pakistan, I think, is yeah. one of them I've seen yeah. lately. Right. How much What what's the main difference that you see when somebody, you know, spends a little bit more money? To hire this American cold caller with no accent, right? Et cetera, et cetera. Well, you know, and there, there's a, a couple long answers floating around my head, and I'll try to shorten them up. Um, the first thing is the cool, the way that I price my pricing out is you have no overhead, mm. and I think what people forget, oh, I'm gonna do it myself. I'm gonna sign up for PropStream, mm-hmm. 120 bucks a month, ching. I'm gonna get Badge Leads Dialer, 150 bucks a month, ching. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna get this skip tracing deal. Fifteen cents a skip trace. Yep. Ten thousand records. Fifteen hundred bucks. Chink. Okay, so now we haven't even picked up the fucking phone yet. Mm-hmm. We got fifteen hundred plus one fifty plus one twenty. We haven't even picked up yeah. the phone yet. Then you're gonna put this two thousand dollar investment a month in the hands of someone who really may not even speak English. Mm. Now there's a big difference between speaking English and understanding it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they might be able to read the words on the script. Yeah, Mm -hmm. they can do that. But do they know what's being said to them? And with that disconnect, like how much is that lead really worth you? So I think that putting the foreign person in, I get it. I get it. I get it. And that's why I'm not trying to demonize it. 
but what are we really doing? Yeah. Right? We're setting up this multi-million dollar system. I can guarantee you AT&T may have foreign people answer the phone now. When they fucking started 20 years ago, they did not. Yeah. And they can only do it now because they're 20 years in business and they already know everything to say. And so it's like, you might be like, well, this big corporation did it. Every time I called them. And yeah. And by the way, how frustrated do you get mm -hmm. when you call and it is a Filipino? And you can tell they really don't know the words you're saying. They may say, that's the other thing I've learned about foreign people. When they say the word yes mm. in perfect English, you think they understand. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Wait, hold on. Two weeks later, hold on. Have you just been saying yes, sir? And you have no fucking <laughs> right. idea. Well, you the haven't changed. The, <laughs> yeah. The you don't even know. So, so there's a, so one is the large investment up front. And then don't forget that's standing overhead. So, let me flip another coin on you. You put all that there. Mm -hmm. You do get the $3 an hour VA. You work with them every day for three months to get them good. Yeah. They yeah, quit. you do role play. Right. Yep. You put all this time in. Mm -hmm. Then one day you wake up, you're like, hey, anyone see uh, Joey log in the day? Right. Anyone, Joey, anyone hear from Joey? Uh, you know, he disappears every once in a while. We'll see. Hey, next day. Oh, no. Well, guess what? You just lost three months. Mm -hmm. And that's the other part that people miss. You know, like my average employee has been with me for five and a half years. So it's it's huge what happens. And even if they weren't, I have great systems for a new person to come in and stuff where they can pick it right up. But we 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 miss out on that time. And then as soon as they quit, and this happens to me all the time, clients hire me. I just got a message yesterday. They gave me $211,000 mm -hmm. on, a, on a, one of our deals, on a $1,000 purchase. Wow. And um, man, what was I saying right before that? Mm. I mean, you're talking about like clients and, and, you know, the fact that this guy just calls you, right? I mean, yeah, the foreign, the, 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 the four, you know, to, oh, thank you. People come in, they make a lot of money yep. with us. And the first thing they think is, well, if I made a hundred thousand dollars off of this purchase, I'm just going to use that hundred thousand dollars and build my own team. Right. Everybody. Right? Yep. Every, it's the, that's, this is honestly why I don't like house wholesalers that much mm. is because they're obsessed with bringing everything in house. And that yeah. is so stupid. I honestly think that is so stupid mm -hmm. and it's like, and I get it, but you're just going to go through a lot of pain and then still pay someone else to do it yep. anyways. And so this guy hires me. Makes a lot of money. He called me. I had an interview with him about this. It's on my YouTube channel. Comes back and he goes, Nick, I tried to do it myself. I was $5,000 in, six months in, mm -hmm. I had 10 leads. Yeah. He's like, that's it. He goes, I couldn't believe how much time and energy. He's like, I woke up one day. I was like, get Nick back on the phone. Yeah. We're not doing this anymore. And that's what happens. And it snares us. Mm -hmm. Like it snares our bandwidth. Our We start closing less deals because we're training $3 an hour VAs. Yep. And, you know, the whole thing starts to Im implode on us. Um, so that's, that's one. So the money, the investment. And then the third piece I'll touch on is scams are way too prevalent in America mm -hmm. right now. OK, we're getting AI scams, Filipino scams. We're getting messaged by people in Africa. Mm -hmm. I get all the time. People just I had a guy send me a picture of his busted ass shoes. <laughs> Here's my shoes. Could I get $50 to get new shoes? And my point is, yeah. it comes at us from every angle as Americans. Mm -hmm. So when we pick up the phone and we hear that accent, we are beginning to associate that with scam. Yeah. And not that they're scamming us, but. I think social media mm -hmm. is putting scams more in our viewpoint. So we're on higher alert. Mm -hmm. So the final point that I'll make other than money and longevity, are they going to quit on you one day after all that effort is what is, what rapport loss are you act? What, how many leads are you losing? Mm -hmm. Because they're going, yeah, right. Yeah. You're going to buy this house. You're going to buy this million yeah. dollar house. I don't think so. Right. And so I think that's the third part about foreign callers. I agree, dude. I agree a hundred percent. I think we're totally being trained for that. And um and and I dude, I completely agree. And it's only gonna get worse, right? Yeah. Like it's not gonna get better. Right. You know, because people getting are just smarter. People are just gonna keep doing it. Yeah. And Americans are getting smart, right? Like yeah. we understand, you know, we get it, you know. I mean, I don't dude, I don't even answer my phone really anymore. Yeah. Right. I mean, like once in a blue moon, I'll answer because I just have a gut feeling that like this it's, is a real it's number. important, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but dude, I'm real quick to hang up, bro. Yeah. Like the, I mean, I'll give somebody like three seconds yeah. to like 
hear their tonality yeah, and like right. get, hear the first couple words out of their mouth and I'm immediately making a decision. Yeah, I'm either hanging up on your ass yeah. or I'll talk to you, yeah. you know? And 100%. dude, I would argue that nine times out of 10, I'm hanging up. Yeah, 100%. And you that's know? the thing about the American sounding good mm-hmm. on the phone and sounding American. You can yep. you can tell, um, and that's why people, they say it's not that, oh, they're in America. It's that they live in America. I don't mm-hmm. even care if they're Filipino and they live in America. Yeah. Go to an American bar. You're gonna. That's a different language communication style, right? So it's not so much that they can't be foreign, mm-hmm. right? But if they have to understand the culture, they have to understand the words. And my, our, our Americans, I call them like Olympians. Yeah. You know, they adapt, they overcome. I track all the stats. So I just mentioned that two days ago, I just made a post. I just terminated all my foreign cold calling division. Oh, wow. Yeah. Totally done. And I and I was checking the stats. And first of all, no one's buying it. Everyone's buying American. That's number one. And the rare people that do buy it, even though I charge half as much for the foreign callers as I do for American, I analyze the cost per lead. They're paying six times more on the cost per lead mm. because the foreign person isn't is as burning effective. through data. That's right. Yeah. And to let's like just let everyone know, it didn't used to be like that. Mm-hmm. Our foreign callers used to be as good as the Americans yep. statistically. And I used to push, if you see old videos of mine, I'm like foreign, 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 because I'm always pushing mm-hmm. what gets my clients the most value sure. because then they come back for more. And so to everything we've been talking about has been proven by the statistics that mm-hmm. I've seen. And when I logged in yesterday and I realized that even having foreign callers on my website is just sidetracking my customers mm-hmm. into making a poor decision. Mm-hmm. I was like, why even have that? There should be no poor decisions yeah, on just my website. Be, be, be known for American college. That's right. Yeah. Like and that becomes your new brand. Because sometimes yeah. people see the price and they think, well, I'll save 200 yeah. bucks, but you won't. And then they get in their own head and then maybe they don't buy it all. Right. Because they overthink it. Yeah. Too many choices. Yep. So I'm like, you know what? And I don't want, like they said, there should be no bad decisions on my website. Mm-hmm. Everything should be. And the real truth is, if you're in a saturated market and you're thinking of foreign, just blow the fuck up with tax. Yeah. That's my real. And that's the other point. Tax is so good right now what do you think about text though when it comes to like the carriers and all that like how do you how do people get around that because i mean we dude we used to murder text right and now we really don't even do it anymore dude so i'm blessed it's a couple things my grandfather was literally a priest okay okay and i i do not have to put a stop reply stop to opt out message on my text messages I can put addresses in my text messages. So there's a lot of things that I'm able to do with texting that other companies can't do anymore. So to your point, with the restrictions, I do believe texting's dead. So it's like, hey, if you have to put reply stop to opt out, you might as well be saying, I'm a robot. Please don't sell me. As soon as anyone sees (laughs) reply stop to opt out, they're like, fuck you. You put no effort into this. Mm -hmm. Right. I know you loaded me up into a software and you clicked a button. Yep. My software doesn't have reply stop to opt out requirements. And I think that's because I'm grandfathered in, whether it's from my actual grandfather or I have been A2P10 DLC registered for three years. Got it. So years ago, I I had a developer build me out a custom texting platform and he made me do the A2P years ago. And I was very annoyed with it because no one had to do it yet. But now I'm realizing he had me do it so long ago. I get like a a hundred, I don't want to say a hundred percent deliverability. Deliverability is not an issue with us. Mm -hmm. Um, Our response rate is anywhere from five to 15%. That's response rate. Wow. And then our leads are also through the roof. Our average texting campaign is getting a lead right now in every 80 to 150 text messages sent. Wow. And I sell 500 for 82 bucks. Wow. Okay. So it's like, it's really crazy. So our texting is blowing up. I have several customers doing like 25,000 a month. Uh, with us. And, and I think it's because no reply stop to opt out. And it's ours also very manual. So like I have an employee going in, loading up the list, clicking send. I then have employees going in, reading responses and typing responses. Yeah. So it's, I don't have like this like big AI machine, mm-hmm. but I think that that also could be benefiting me, right? I'm sure. not spamming as hard the servers and stuff like that. So texting with us has been a saving grace. Mm-hmm. Um, I always say, I don't know how long, this is going to go on for. I don't know if regulations texting is a lot like the interest rates. Mm-hmm. <laughs> are yeah. they going to keep going up? Are they going to start going down? So I don't know if regulations are going to get crazier or worse. I do tell people get it while it's hot. Yeah. You know, at least, at, at least from us, mm-hmm. you know, it's all you can do. Right. Right. You can't yeah. predict the future. That's right. You hey, know, yeah. and you're going to adapt. 
Yeah. And sorry. you're going to pivot and be nimble and, and went just like you did with foreign to going all American, right? Yeah, it's exactly. like, Hey, as times change, you're going to change. Yeah. We're right? going to have to figure this mm -hmm. out yeah. for sure. Yeah. No question about it. How difficult, you know, as an entrepreneur running the type of company that you run, you know, like for me, right. I've between all my companies, I probably have 250 people, right. Um, you know, and hiring is something that I think a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with, right. They yeah. struggle to find good talent. They struggle to interview them the right way to do maybe multiple interviews, to do a disc test with them, whatever, right. Like yeah. you, you see entrepreneurs that go through the pain and agony of building companies and hiring and all this crap. How have you found success in, in hiring, you know, and like, what does that look like for you? Just out of curiosity. Yeah. So like when I was a restaurant manager, that's really what taught me everything. Mm -hmm. Right. So restaurants are very hands on. And I was always in charge of training at every restaurant I was in because I was just really good at it. So when the person got in, well, I created a training schedule for them. Day one orientation, day two position, day three, when we would test and all this mm -hmm. other stuff. So what I call that now is I call that the gauntlet. What gauntlet do you put your people through? Yeah. So like for my cold callers, I'll give you an example. First of all, everyone's hired. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's my motto. I'm like that scene from Dangerous Minds. <laughs> Michelle Pfeiffer, you all get an A to start, yeah. right? You're all hired. Now what? Now I need you to watch my cold calling course. It's completely free. Okay. After you watch the cold calling course, let me know. Mm -hmm. So one thing I do, my gauntlet is their eagerness. Watch the cold calling course. Let me know. If they never let me know, they're fired. Yep. Right. <laughs> right. They have to, I'm not going to say, Hey, did you finish that? Sure. Nope. Cause I need you to be a self starter. Mm -hmm. Cause I told you earlier, you, you make your own schedule. Yep. So I'm not going to be reminding you to clock in the same way. I'm not going to be reminding you to finish these steps. So first thing is cold calling course. Second thing is typing test. I have to make sure they can type a certain speed. If they can't type fast enough, they can't take notes during the call. If they can't take notes during the call, mm -hmm. we might have inaccurate notes, mm -hmm. right? So that's number two. Take this typing test. Let me know what your score is. They never reply. They lost the opportunity. Got right? it. Then the next thing I've learned is I need five hires to get one good one. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, get to five. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Just like in your lead gen, mm -hmm. right? Hey, it takes 20 leads to close a deal. Well, I don't want to talk about five fucking leads, yep. get to 20 leads and then we'll talk about the deal, mm -hmm. right? Like it's, we're talking too early. So, um, so then that's the, that that's the next part. Um, then I put them in a one-on-one -on -one meeting with my uh, training coordinator and he clocks them in, walks into software and then does three, uh, like three hours of live calls with them Yeah, is basically what he does. And then by that, if they're still on board, normally they're good. Cool. Okay. Because that's quite, that's quite a gauntlet, you know, for them to go through. Um, that's how I hire my cold callers. And then I have my manager work with them for 30 minutes a day and then eventually just go to bi-weekly mm -hmm. check-ins. Yep. Then just to take that system a little bit further, just so everyone knows in order for my cold call, I don't just like hire people off of the street mm -hmm. in order for my cold callers to work for me. They have to produce a minimum amount of leads per hour. Got it. Every cold caller must produce at least one lead per two hours of work or they cannot work here. Mm -hmm. Then every week we track everyone's leads per hours and whoever the bottom three are, they get one-on-one -on -one coaching. Mm. If the bottom three's numbers don't improve over three weeks, they don't work for me anymore. Yep. Okay. So it's like, I have this like amazing cyclical system where, and I don't really ever have to fire people. Normally people always change or get my trainer's great. So he does an amazing job getting everyone up to par, helping them fix their issues. We're actually at our highest performance ever right now. Wow. Nationwide, we're averaging 0.8 leads per hour. Wow. Okay. And an hour of calling is about 150 dials. Mm -hmm. So we're averaging one lead right now nationwide in about 189 dials. Wow. Which is fucking crazy. Yeah. But it's because of all these systems I'm laying out. It's not just like a fluke. I didn't just mm -hmm. hire the right person. Right. Um, so that's how I hire cold callers. So the next thing would be my managers. Mm -hmm. One thing I'm doing with managers is I'm making them come over my house for three months. I don't have a building. Right. Yep. But I'm making them come over my house for three months. Right. If, and that's for a couple. I got to gauge you out. Mm -hmm. Right. Your life could be crazy. You could be a great employee on Zoom. But when you hang out, your wife is fighting, your kids are fighting, you're all distracted. Yep. You know, you got to work with these people. Mm -hmm. Hey, you're way too like, I don't, you know, I, I, you're here 40 hours, but you're handling personal shit 20 yeah. hours. I, I need somebody working yeah. for 40. And it's important for us to know that. So with leadership, I bring them into my home. Uh, if most of them, I try to hire local. But if I didn't, I would just fly them in, get them a hotel, tell them to show up every day for two to three months. And then let's just, let's do that. And that's really 
that's not training as much as me gauging or influencing, right? Uh, some people come in, they're negative about their last job. That's okay. Uh, if I give you some advice and you're positive, we're great. If I give you some advice and you're negative and then you're still negative and you're still negative, okay, hey, I'm going to fly you back home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? So like, I kind of put people, my theory is to put people through a gauntlet, mm. you know, a gauntlet of experiences and not to let your finger off the pulse. So the thing is people will, people want to get paid to do nothing. Mm -hmm. And the more money you make, like you and me, the more they think they could come, more some people think they could come and work for us and get paid to do nothing. Because they want to be like, yeah, well, he's got it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know Nick makes enough money for me to work 20 hours and get paid for 40. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do make enough money to do that. <laughs> but I don't Doesn't want mean you're going to. Yeah. <laughs> right? Right? yeah. Yeah. I can afford to lose money. You're right. Yeah. But I don't want to. Mm -hmm. And so I think another part is like, you know, weeding out the people who like, I want someone to take advantage of me, mm -hmm. but I need to be taking advantage of them. Right. And that's by getting the results in my business that I'm looking for. Feel free. Hey, if you can get me 40 hours of results in 20 hours, I'm right. good. But you know what? When your shit starts breaking and then I start digging into what you're doing and now I found out, like you can work 20 hours and run a perfect apartment mm -hmm. is what I'm trying to say. And I will pay you for 40. Sure. But if you're working 20 hours and everything's crashing down around you and I have to do your job and mine, then I am, then, then it's like not a good fit. So I'm not yeah. like super micromanagerial, but we got to earn that time gap. A hundred percent. Yeah. It makes sense. What would you say to somebody watching right now? And they're trying to decide between like, like they're, they want to get into wholesaling, right. And they want to, you know, uh, make a lot of money of course. Right. And do all that. And they, let's just say they have a budget, you know, and their budget's not a ton of money, but they've got a little bit of money to play with. They want to go to the direct to seller route. Cause yeah. there's obviously different ways you can get into wholesaling. Yeah. Right. And they're looking at like pay-per-click and like PPL and all that. And then they're looking at like cold calling and texting, yeah. right? Like what, what, in your opinion, when you look at that type of person, What's what the, do you typically say? Hey, you should start here or there. So here's what I tell everybody. Cost per lead is everything in the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, why is that? Well, each lead you get is experience. So a lot of, a lot of coaching companies use me as like their primary source mm -hmm. because a lot of people don't like direct mail. Yep. And I honestly think new people should stay away from direct mail and PPC. And it's for the simple fact that those leads are too expensive to learn on. Period. Mm. Period. Direct mail leads, $300 to $1,000 each. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Uh, if you're brand new, you can't afford to spend 300 bucks to learn a lesson. You with me? That's yep. too much. Yeah. I'm, I'm brand new. I can't, uh, you know, I'm, I, I, you know, so what I tell people is cold calling and texting is going to get you your lowest cost per lead. Now, arguably, they will they might be harder leads to close. But again, that just serves you again. Mm -hmm. If you start learning to close cheaper, uglier leads, what happens? You master the calling and texting. Mm -hmm. Then what happens when you go to direct mail and PPC? Yeah. All of a sudden, everything feels like a cakewalk. Oh, oh, these are my, oh, wow, this is awesome. Oh, I don't mind spending 300 bucks per lead because I'm not spending all this mm -hmm. time on the phone with them anymore. So my advice to everyone is calling and texting is the way to go. And it's immediate. Mm. PPC, I bet we have to get ramped up. We have to get our account set up. We have to get our credit card attached. We have to get auto pay. We have to figure out our audience. We have to figure out our message, mm -hmm. right? All that. Direct mail. You pay the post office, you pay the direct mail company, they, oh, it'll be out in three weeks, yeah. right? Uh, you hire me today, we're literally starting on Monday. Wow. And you're getting a lead the same day it's generated from us that day. And so like if you are new, that's the cool thing. If you're new, we're going to help you with your learning curve. If you're already a pro, you're going to fucking love it even mm. mo. <laughs> <laughs> if you're already a pro, you're going to love it even more. And the reason why is because you can a pro can respect all the work that we're doing. A lot of the, a lot of my pro clients now go, look, bro, done. I've done outbound. I managed it myself. I can't believe you're doing it at this price. This is crazy. Like we're, we're in, like they can really respect it. The new person doesn't know the value proposition mm -hmm. that we're really offering yet because mm -hmm. they haven't gone through the pain. Um, and that's why I just advise them of we're on a cost per lead game. Yeah. And two things I tell on my clients is every leads worth two to five minutes of your time. Don't you ever read fucking notes and talk yourself out of a lead. Mm -hmm. That's the dumbest thing you could do, right? Call them. If they're an asshole, hang up on them. Yeah. <laughs> if they're not an asshole, never hang up on them. 
talk to them until they go to bed that night, right? Because mm-hmm. you're going to get something out of it. And then um, the, the other thing I tell, um, every every everyone's worth two to five minutes. And, um, and then always make sure you just have that great attitude. Mm-hmm. You know, if you, my number one question right now is, Nick, what ninja advice do you have for me? And I bring up leads just like a relationship. And if you're dating someone, and you tell yourself you hate something about them. I hate this about them. I hate this about them. I hate this about them. Every time you see that person, that relationship's going to be worse. Mm-hmm. Guaranteed. Whether it's your boss or your girlfriend or your lover or your parent or whoever. And so I call that negative self-talk. And if you, it's okay. I, I understand. We're going to read a lead and go, that sucks. I, yeah. I understand. But let's not rattle on about it. Mm. Right? If you find yourself constantly trash-talking leads, Stop. And, and so that's the other big piece of advice I give. And I go, give yourself a positive attitude, call the lead, mm-hmm. see how it goes. Uh, because what they'll do is they'll talk themselves. And I could see it in my client's face. I meet with all my clients weekly one-on-one. Um, if they book the call, it's a free call every week they get invited to. Um, and I can tell, hey, hey, we got 60 leads. Yeah, how'd those go? Oh, I uh, didn't call them yet. Wow, 60 leads. Yeah. And then they'll message me and they'll be like, well, what about the leads we didn't get? Are we going to call them again? I'm like, hey, could you focus yeah. on, on the things? That's the other thing is like people, they want to be distracted mm-hmm. by maybe the negative side of things, right? And it's like, no, focus on the ones we gave you. Focus on having a good attitude. Mm-hmm. Clearly, you told yourself, for some reason, you told yourself you didn't have to call these 60 leads. Mm-hmm. And whatever that reason is, you cannot tell yourself that again on your next campaign. A, you're never going to pay me again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if, yeah. you, if you never call these leads, you're never paying me again. So we have a mutual interest uh, to get th- to get you on the phone. With yeah. Them, yeah. You, you know? want they have to make money. Right. You it, want them to make money. Yeah. hundred percent. I tell my clients all the time, literally nobody other. There's no one that wants you to be more successful other than you than me. hundred percent. Like I'm yeah. right here with because I'm also no contracts, no commitments, which we haven't covered that either. Yep. But everything we do is a single one off service. Which is awesome. Yeah. It's unheard of in the industry. Well, that's really. why, that's why people love me too. Yeah. Is uh, one of my big competitors right now is land callers. I'll mm-hmm. give them a plug because please call that sales guy. <laughs> they charge $3,300 a month for foreign cold callers. And they will call 10,000 records over three months. I charge $3,600 for 10,000 American dials. This guy. Wow. How profitable is that company? where this guy is charging $3,300 per month. And I had a guy call me and he goes, and it's a three month contract. And and then they charge you and he goes, then after telling me it's $9,900, he says there's a $150 setup fee. I'm like, you couldn't have just worked that into the 10,000. Right. <laughs> like, is it really worth it? And you know, it's interesting because I don't know what any of my competitors do because mm-hmm. I'm focused on what I'm doing. But you know, that no contracts and the reasonable pricing. And like I mentioned, if you even just add up the overhead, you would accumulate before anyone even picks up the phone. I swear my price is equal to the sole cost of the overhead alone mm. before we even put training or systems or people in place. Sure. Yeah. hundred percent as an entrepreneur, you know, and then a couple more questions and we'll wrap, but you know, what have you found to be the most difficult or challenging thing in scaling to a seven figure company? You know, yeah, we're, we're, we're almost there right now, right? Like, you know, some guy asked me, he goes, why don't you scale lead mining? Well, first we're up 50% this year over last year. Mm-hmm. That is considered scale. So anything 35% or greater is mathematically scaling. Yep. Um, and the other response I made to him, I said, first of all, we are scaling. Second of all, things are currently breaking at the perfect pace. Mm. So what I would say is so many people want to scale, scale, scale. I would let nature take its course a little bit more. Right. Do all the right things. Fix the small problems as they break. Don't try to dump a ton of money into Mark. Don't try to do that because that's going to invite more problems than you ever even thought. Oh, the website crash. Why the website crash? Well, we're not used to having 2000 visitors a day. Oh, well, our systems broke. Why did our systems break? Well, we've never had 200 orders submitted in a day. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised how confusing shit gets for people. And you actually need just how you have three offices, right? We spoke earlier. You said you have three. If you could fit them all in one, you would, but it doesn't make sense. Right. So when, as we scale and grow, we have to compartmentalize Mm. our things. So, um, and even now we're in our biggest year ever. Uh, we're going to break a million dollars next month. We're going to hit 1.6 mil this year. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I'm going to net a million dollars. I'm a very profitable company. Yeah. So I'm going to net a million myself. And I am definitely going through some growing pains mm -hmm. right now. And the difficulty is the layers. The company was easier to run when it was me and two customer service people. Mm -hmm. A lot less. Now I've got me, a customer service manager, an, an order op processing manager, and then each of them have two employees. Mm. So now I have to convey my point to somebody who then has to convey my point to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Right. And now we're playing the telephone game. <laughs> yeah. Right. So now I have to be like, OK, but do you get it? <laughs> because if mm -hmm. you don't get it, then your employees aren't going to get it. Mm -hmm. And the same thing I said about foreign callers, all employees do. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No. You yeah. should be saying no, sir. I actually, I don't mind if you don't get it. I mind if you say you got it and you don't got mm, it. <laughs> for sure. I'll explain this to you for two hours straight if I need to. You know, so I think the scalability comes from the adding additional employees, which is also required with growing. One person can't handle the 250 orders mm -hmm. a month we get now. So I need to grow. Um I mean, it's managing how they interact with each other. I mean, I'm becoming a corporation mm -hmm. and that's weird. You know, to have that level of stuff going on. To say that out loud. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Like there's layers now. I mean, yeah. and the reason why I say corporation is different is because I'm now, before I was a CEO, but I was basically the manager, right? Now I'm the CEO and I have three managers and then they have employees and one of those managers even has a manager. So it's like when, it, when we're at the layers, that's where I feel like we're corporatizing yeah. because you can't, I worked at one place that was corporate and he goes, we don't like to be called corporate. I was like, well. That sounds weird. And that's probably why things are confusing around here <laughs> because yeah. you're there and you're trying not to be there. And it's like, I'm the opposite. I'm trying to own it. I need it. This needs to feel like a corporation from the inside. It shouldn't feel like it to you as a customer. It should feel mom and poppy, mm -hmm. right? All customers get my cell phone and you can all book calls with me. That shouldn't feel like a corporation, but my internal systems need to feel like a corporation. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. What's your best advice just in general, being an entrepreneur, managing a company, scaling, you know, staying healthy, you're a healthy guy, right? Like what's just your best advice to an entrepreneur out there watching that wants to live a well-rounded life, make a lot of money, do really well, yeah. blah, blah, blah. No, I love that. And I, I think it would be to, you know, don't forget to like invest in yourself. Um, and the dumbest things are investing in yourself. I take Epsom salt baths four days a week. Mm. I get massages twice a week. I have a one wheel. I literally ride for an hour a day. You know, I do smoke a lot of marijuana. You know, <laughs> I just want to plug that. I do. Right. And yeah. I need, I, I always say that's more for the people around me than it is. For me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll be a little high yeah. strung. Um, you know, and, and, and I share all those things because when I go on vacation, mm -hmm. they get disrupted. And as soon as they get disrupted, I get grumpy and I forget how much I love the life I created for myself. Mm. And I think it's important for us to pay attention to things that like really make us happy. And just one other thing is when I first got wealthy, I bought a lot of shit. I have three cars. I have three jet skis. Yep. I have three e-bikes. I've got more properties. I, I got some properties that are a pain in the ass that I need to, I should liquidate. I have a lot. Mm -hmm. And to the more seasoned person, my current advice right now is I am now making decisions that only allow me to sleep better at night. I am no longer making decisions that keep me up at night. Um, whether that's investing or anything that anything that could have a potential to disrupt my sleep, mm -hmm. I am not doing anymore. And it's because I've done that. I made the money, I bought all the toys, and then I'm like, well, now now there's a jet ski broken mm -hmm. every week. Now there's a car that's not running. Oh, I didn't. I my all my cars are custom wrapped. If I don't wash it for three months, I got to get the whole fucking thing rewrapped. Yeah. And it's like before you know it, we're creating all these bandwidth sucks in our life. And at one point we thought that having three cars would make us happy, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. yep. but at, at the end of the day, it doesn't, it may make us feel accomplished. It may allow us to tell us that story that we told ourselves when we were a kid and we finally made it. And that means multiple vehicles. But at the end of the day, I'm losing sleep over it. So to the seasoned person, it would be to find your passions, lean, always have time for yourself. I have a mm. lot of time. I maybe have too much time for myself. I could probably spend more time in front of a computer to be honest with you right now. Um, and then, you know, the next part is to find what really, I know what really, I, since I bought in everything, mm. I actually know what makes me happy now. And I'm no longer spending money on shit that doesn't make me happy. Dude, 
That's a phenomenal way to end this podcast because I could not agree with you more. I mean, I've done exactly what you've done. Yeah. You know, uh, in the last four years, I've had three boats, two jet skis, five cars. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, right. and I and I honestly hated it. Yeah, I really did. Right. I hated it. You yeah. know. Um, and I sold like a lot of my stuff. Like yeah. I sold my boat. I sold my. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um. And uh, and I'm living a simple life, and I'm actually enjoying it a lot more. You know, like yeah. I there's not the the weight of of all of it, right? Like you know, yeah. all insurance on everything, just everything, right? Yeah. And I think there's levels to the game. You know, when you look at like people like Tony Robbins or Ed Milet or Grant Cardone or whoever, right? Like then, you know, like Ed Milet, he's got a house in Coeur d'Alene. He's got a house here, a house there. It's like you can pay a house manager to manage that house while you're not there for four or five months. Right. And then when you go there, it's everything's good. It's the immaculate. trees have been trimmed. Yeah. The lawn's been mowed. Yeah. You've got milk in the refrigerator, right. right? But until you get to that level, you know, you're managing it all. Yeah. And, that's right. and that's a huge pain in the ass, yes. right? Yes. So, dude, I agree, bro. And that's my problem is I, I know I'm a great manager, mm -hmm. and that's a downfall. Yeah. So then I try to manage everything. And, like, now I'm never buying a property again without a property man, ever. Yeah. Never. Never, ever. Totally. You know, and, and to your point is like, you can have three jet skis. Who's your jet ski manager? Mm -hmm. You got a guy coming over weekly to run them and clean them yep. and make sure they don't have barnacles and do all. So it's like, you can't just have it, right? No. Everything has maintenance to it. And and that, that that's really big for me is I'm like, you know, I'm not good at maintenance. Labor of love is not my jam. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know, it really is. I just want to, you know, live my life. And you've, you've done it on a bigger level, you know, than I have. So, you know, I can, I can only imagine, um, and yeah, and it feels good. I just sold my RV. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Twenty four thousand dollar loss. Don't care. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, right there with you. No, don't give I'm yeah. glad it was sold. Yeah. I don't even care. The guy, this guy calls me up. I'm like, it's ten thousand. He goes, Will you take sixty five hundred? I said, If you fucking show up right now at my house yeah. with sixty five hundred, yeah. Yes. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's so go. funny, dude. Yeah. yeah, I'm right there with you, bro. Every boat I sold, I lost my ass. You yeah. know, I've owned, dude. I've owned like twenty seven cars. I'm twenty nine years old. I've owned twenty seven cars yeah. in my life, right? And I think two of them, I made money. Yeah. You right. know, and I didn't make much. Right. But like I made money. But you money. didn't lose. Yeah, I didn't lose. Yeah. <laughs> right. the, the 25, I lost money on everyone. Yeah. Right. right. And I have a list. I have, it's in my phone of every car I've ever really? owned. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, and so, dude, yeah, 100%, man. And now I'm at a point where I'm like, dude, I got my Tesla. I'm happy. Yeah. You know? That's right. It's an electric car. We settle right? in. Right? Yeah. yeah. We yeah, settle, you in just settle in. Yeah. And I think it's just part of, you know, the majority of the people I've interviewed, Nick, you know, they've all gone through that. Right. Right. Like, yeah. I think... You know, and it's so funny, right? Because guys like Cody and other people used to always tell me, right? And I think there's actually a saying out there. It's like, you know, everybody says money won't make you happy, but everybody wants to find out for themselves, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Because it's the truth, right? Yeah. Like, you know, you'll sit in a room when you're on the path of, you know, growing and scaling anything and other people that have been where you are will tell you the stories like we're telling right now thing, right? Yeah. and then they'll go do it anyways. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think it's just human nature. Right. I think there's some things in life that we just have to do on our own yeah. and learn on our own. Yeah. And yeah. that's the one thing I think almost every entrepreneur that I've ever talked to yeah. has gone through where they've, they've made a lot of money. They blew a lot of money and they're like, never again. Yeah. I learned my lesson. Yep. And I think with me, it was my inner child. Mm. I wanted to say yes to everything I was told no to, mm. you know what I mean? My dad, I remember when I bought my first car, I was like, you, you can't do that. Well, I came home with a new car that day. Right. And so when I made money, I found myself really making inner Nick happy. Mm. And, uh, and I like, and it's also good. We also get clarity through this. So it's not all bad. What I would say is probably release things earlier than you need to release them. Mm -hmm. By the time you're done with it, you're way too done with it. Mm. That's like the other parts. Like it's okay to buy it and sell it. But when you hold on for it for another year and then a, something breaks on it bigger, mm. or, and then you're like, then you're at like my job. Yeah. Right. I was already done. It took a 90 hour a week schedule to be like, bam, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, well now I'm out of here. And so one that's one of my big lessons. Is I'm trying not to get to the pain point. Let me just let me release things that slight discomfort <laughs> 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 yeah. rather than I hate talking about the RV or yeah. I hate that property in Vermont with all the meth heads in it. Like I yeah. don't like <laughs> release mm -hmm. it sooner. But, sure, but like dude. we said, it helps us. There's a journey there, that has its own journey of now we know our happiness. And now someone could say, oh, you should get that. No, 
Actually, I shouldn't. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. I tried bro. it; didn't work. Yeah, I, I'm the same way, man. I bought about my dad's like the first boat I bought. You know, because yeah, you wanna you wanna prove to the world, man. You right. know, there's that underlying. You know, the whole, the world told me I couldn't do it, so I got to do 100%. it, right? Hundred percent. And I remember my dad told me. My dad said, "You know that the the two best days of boat ownership." Or the day you buy it and the day you sell it, you know, and I couldn't agree more, right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, dude, Nick, so we're going to put all your information down below, bro. Um, we're going to have our discount code down there, yeah. right? Um, that'll be code Zayback. Yeah. Uh, so for anybody watching who wants to use any services that any you day. provide, they'll get a discount when they yeah. when they use that code. What is that website where they need to go to right now? The website is leadminingpros.com. And that coupon code will take $1 off your order, but everything you buy, we add 10% on. Mm. So if you just buy a $1,000 lead gen package, you get an $1,100 lead gen package. And that coupon code's reusable for life. Mm. So it's not a single one-time thing. Every time you visit, every purchase you make, use Zayback and you'll get that 10% bonus every time. Incredible, bro. And then what if uh, somebody wants to follow you on social media? Are you on social media? I'm, I'm biggest on Facebook, cool. which I know is weird. Um, you can tell I was raised by boomers, um, <laughs> but I'm biggest on Facebook. You get a lot of engagement on Facebook. Dude, my, my shit is nuts. I watch all your, yeah. I post crazy shit too. Um, yesterday was National Girlfriends mm -hmm. Day. And everyone was posting a picture of their girlfriend. I posted a picture of my left hand. And I was like, baby, you've never left I me. I bet you got 800 likes on that. How many <laughs> likes did you get? I got, I think I'm at 150 with like 100 okay. comments. All right, you're going to get more. Yeah, dude, it's, it, it's yeah. crazy. But um, Facebook, I'm all over it. And I'll give you a quick link for everyone to join me there. And, uh, and, and feel free to engage. My cell phone number's on the website. Cool. You guys can call me directly. You can book a call with me on the website. I don't care if you're going to buy or not. If yep. you want a book, book. I'm going to be here. Uh, the be the worst case, I'll give you a bunch of knowledge and mm -hmm. give you a more informed decision. Love it, dude. Yeah. Appreciate you being on the show, yeah, bro. Thank you for it's been me. a long time in the in the making, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah, and I'll put all of his information down below. So if you stay to the very end, thank you so much. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't already. Like the video. Go follow Nick. Check out Lead Mining Pros. Use code Zayback when you do. And I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.